Okay, welcome back everyone. We're here live in Las Vegas. This is SiliconANGLE and Wikibon's theCUBE. This is our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the ceiling from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm joined by my co-host Dave Vellante, co-founder of Wikibon.org. And again, we got another executive from Amazon here inside theCUBE, Terry Hanold, VP of Cloud Commerce, Amazon Web Services. Uh, welcome to theCUBE. Uh, thanks, I'm really happy to be here. So we want to get into, you're Vice President of Cloud commerce, okay, well that basically is the marketplace. You guys are obviously innovating. We had uh, uh, folks on uh, who head up the ecosystem, and obviously you're, you're disrupting the market, at the same time you're innovating. You rarely see that in a company these days, and when, when people are doing both of those things, it's really a special thing. So you guys are doing a great job, congratulations on that. Um, but you're, you got to roll out some solutions now to help the partners make money. That's yes. the commerce side of it, buyers and sellers. So give us a little, give us a little, uh, uh, overview on what does the cloud commerce mean and what's some of the tech behind it and what are you guys doing for folks out there? At the end of the day, you know, Andy Jassy said I'm reducing the prices for customers. It's the opposite for partners, they want to make money. So if you have a good ecosystem, everyone's getting paid, everyone's having fun, disrupting solutions. So talk about what you guys have. So on the marketplace, we've got two sets of people we think about. The people who are consuming technology and then the people who are building the technology and providing it. So buyers and sellers, or in our case, technologists and software companies. And so for when we think about how do we want to uh, be agile and how do we want to innovate for both of these, the answer is for the guys who are using technology, we want to take all of the muss and all of the fuss out of I have a problem, I need a database to store data in, all the way to I have a database and I can start putting data in it. And traditionally, you've got people who, well, I have to do an RFP, I have to do a bunch of research, I have to get my procurement team involved, they're going to uh, do the license for me, then I have to talk to IT, they're going to spin up the hardware servers for me, then I have to deploy the software, and weeks or months later, now I have a database. So, so sorry? Go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, with the marketplace for the buyers, the whole notion is you find your software, you have pricing that is, you know, 20 cents an hour or 30 cents an hour, just like the cloud, and spinning up a database, you click a button, the hardware is provisioned, the software is laid down, it's configured, and you're ready to go within a minute. You know what's great about Amazon is the diversity of people who work for the company and in the, in the partners. We have James Hamilton, old school dude, he just loves his job, he's got his, having so much fun, I and mean, it's almost like he's intoxicated every day at work, just on the, on the pure geekness of it. Uh, then you got the young guns coming out of school, we talked to some Stanford CS guys, and Carnegie Mellon, building solutions. So you got a range of, of diversity of, of people who just love what you're doing. But if you think about the B2B marketplace, they've been around for a while, you know, B2B exchanges, you know, buyers and sellers, it's kind of been around for a while. But when you bring the notion of DevOps into the equation, kind of the disruption side, it's not selling products per se, it's actual software or API-based services where you're launching primitives out there. That's a whole, that's a DevOps commerce model mm -hmm. in a way that, that is going to change the game. So if that's the, the belief that the API economy is around the corner, what is the key design criteria for you guys as you want to enable explosive commerce out there? What's, what's, what's the secret and what's the guiding principles that you guys operate under? So the, the fundamental magnetic north for us, the core tenant is agility. How can I let people build software and people sell software faster? If I can make them faster, they can come up and invent whatever they want to go invent. If I can make the cost of failing lower, they can go ahead and do it. So with concrete examples, if I want to try a database, but it only costs me 50 cents an hour, or 10 cents an hour. I can try it. If it's working well, that's great. Now I'm going to move it to production. If it's not, I'm going to stop. And for a software company, I'm tired of paying uh, you know, sales reps to spend nine months trying to negotiate contracts, uh, do proof of concepts, just to get a customer. If I can get a customer in a matter of minutes, all of a sudden I'm getting feedback right away from my market. I can change my pricing or my product, and I can iterate as fast as AWS or another fast software company. So the main benefit is time to value, right? Yes, so essentially absolutely. you can double down where it's working, yep. and if it's not working, you can fix it, get back on the track, if you will. Get started fast, fail fast when necessary, and when you're succeeding, scale fast. Succeed fast and scale fast. Yeah. Yeah. Right? You guys are pretty dogmatic about um, your, your offerings, making those offerings available to all the customers. Yep. Choice, right? I mean, I got to have the same security, the same everything. Yep. I mean, it's, Small guys, big guys, doesn't matter. You don't like to do one-offs, <laughs> from what I can gather, yep. right? Um, my specific question is around bring your own license. So yep. you got guys bringing their own license, that's cool. But once, 
when that occurs, you want that software to be available in the marketplace, mm -hmm. correct? So how's that work? So you, you start off maybe as a bring your own license deal, you encourage people to put it up in the marketplace, there's like a grace period, right? There's some fuzzy language in your website that I've been trying to understand. I think you probably can help clear it up or what's so going on there? The underlying notion is uh, choice. So customers should buy software the way they want to buy it. It's our job to enable it. It's not really our job to force them one way or the other. So if they have licenses that they've already bought, they should be able to come up, use their software. We should make moving their license onto AWS as simple as possible. Some, a lot of that is our responsibility. A lot of it, honestly, is also the software company's responsibility. They've got to make licenses that allow people to run their software in the cloud. But we work very hard with other software partners like Microsoft and Oracle to try to go do this. Um, the other piece of it is, uh, once we've got a lot of options, if someone's got their own license, that's great. If they want to do it by the hour, we want to provide that as well. And so, it's really up to the customer to choose. Okay, it's, but there's a, there's, a, there's a third party in here, which is the ISV, right? right? Now, many ISVs, we just had Splunk on, they're like, yeah, we love that. Yeah. It's great, it's expanding our market opportunity, and you know, perfect for them. Yep. I can see other ISVs maybe fighting that a little bit. Do you see that kind of friction, and how do you deal with that? Sure. Um, yes, we, we see it. Honestly, the younger companies, they grew up cloud, they're like, I get it, this is great. There are companies who are like, whoa, you know, we've been selling software with certain prices a certain way for years now. Like, we see the cloud, but you got to give us some safety rails. We want to work our way here. How do we kind of split the, the difference? And so, uh, the short answer is, is at launch, the marketplace was really focused on the utility price. You want to pay for your software the same way you're paying for your hardware. So we have partners like SAP and Cisco, companies with big established market bases. They are companies that have been around for decades. They are already, you know what, we're ready to jump in. There are other companies who maybe aren't ready to go there yet. It's our job then as a marketplace to start building out the business models that they want. So over time, you're going to see us adding more and more business models, support for different types of licensing or pricing, so that any seller can sell the software however they want, and hopefully buyers will give them clear market signals about how, what kind of licenses they'd like. Yes, yeah, so it's an interesting balancing act that you have to put so, there, but certainly in the enterprise, you recognize that that certain ISVs you know, approach the market in a certain way, and, and you recognize that, but it's a, it's a minority, right? Is that fair to say? Or? It's, it's a minority, and it's also, it's changing incredibly quickly. Like, if I had conversations two years ago when we were thinking about it, we were still in private conversations, you know, the way the industry thought about the cloud uh, was much different two years ago than it was a year ago than it was six months ago. The pace of acceleration is picking up remarkably. In the last two days here at reInvent, We've had 38 uh, high visibility companies announce new products on the marketplace. So, so I got to follow up on this. Though, yeah. Because there are companies, you know, we, we talk about them all the time, John, that will use audits as a as a as a weapon to get, you know, re, uh, and and uh, enterprise licenses renegotiate. That's not your way. You're the opposite. You send out emails saying, "Hey, did you know?" Oh. If you did this, you could save a bunch of dough. Yeah. You could pay us less. Yeah. I mean, that historically hasn't happened in the enterprise. It's a completely different mindset. <laughs> you feel like that's just inevitable, that that's where the market's going. Is that fair to say? We have a business model. We like it. It's not the only <laughs> business model. It's not our job to impose it on all of our partners. The way I see it is we should make it possible for them to do whatever they want with their business model. We also have customers who have opinions on this. And so, to your specific example, over time as we start putting in more alerts about spend and how you can optimize your spend, we will make that available to uh, uh, ISV partners as well. If they want to use it, they can. We're not going to force it on them. I suspect their customers would like them to go well, use it, but, but that's in between but, but you the know, customers and the market. You're seeing this as you as you give customers money back. What do they do with that money? They pour it back into innovation, right. and so <laughs> you make so more money. So this is the thing, and brilliant. And, and I really believe that if you remove what we firmly believe at AWS is, if you lower costs and make things easier in the long run, you will have more customers, have a better business, and have uh, customers doing more than if you put friction in it and try to scrape every last penny off the, the table. But again, that's yeah. our business model. Yeah. We'll, we're going to let our partners choose and our customers you choose. Got a you got to like, um, of course you like your business model, you're disrupting and you're innovating at the same time. Again, in history, a lot of, it's very rare you see someone do that and 
And you know, you're experienced uh, a software veteran. Uh, you're a couple years over 30, kind of like us. Uh, you've been around the block. Um, <laughs> <right>. you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> I guess keep from trying 10 years, maybe I get younger. Um, but I want to ask you on, on, on two perspectives. One is um, kind of a historical perspective. What's different now, fundamentally, that you can say, hey, you know, I am in, we are in a good spot uh, that makes this world completely different compared to how it used to go in businesses, whether it's buying and selling products. And two, talk about the global impact, because now you're talking about globalization. You're talking about uh, Amazon having geo clouds and geographic uh, snapshotting, some really cool stuff being talked about under the, under the hood. You're now potentially looking at a scenario where I could push a button and sell stuff globally. It's not an easy thing to do. So talk about kind of the perspective of kind of where we are today relative to your experience. And then talk about that global scale. What needs to get done? What do you guys do to allow that globalization? So the biggest change for me over the last, what, how old did Five you say years, I was? Five okay, years? 10 years out of college. Okay, go ahead. 20 years. Um, go back 10. 10's fine. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Is, uh, we are living in a time where when you remove friction, you see more speed and all of a sudden things become possible. So if you drop the costs of infrastructure so that you can buy infrastructure by the, by the dime or by the dollar and not by the $100,000 chunk, all of a sudden people start innovating and building software. It never would have occurred to them to go build before because it took nine months and $100,000 to get a provision so you could go do the testing. So that mindset where younger developers or older developers who are now working today, they don't tolerate some constraints that historically in IT we tolerated. And startups now, like I had startups a decade ago, like they wouldn't tolerate having to go get however many million of dollars and then spending 90% of it on infrastructure. And only well, 10% on engineers. Well there was two taxes, it was the technology tax yeah. of all the kind of gear and yep. software sell, yep. and also time tax, yep. the lag. Yep. And so now, you know, for better or for worse, we're impatient. We want to go be free to innovate and we want to see the results now. And I would say, uh, it, probably this is true as well for the, a lot of the people I work with, we're not as afraid of failure as I was or the teams I worked with 15 years ago because the costs are less. Like we screw up at Amazon with surprising regularity and we look at it and we say, hey, we can do better and it takes us very little time compared to where we were 10 years ago to go fix it. With and minimal collateral damage no, from that exactly. That's the other key We can point do it privately, we can learn like crazy, and that allows us ultimately, I think, to innovate faster than any company I've ever been with and get it right faster because we're not afraid of our own shadow. And so, you know, I don't know how to, without sounding like, a, you know, an academic, I don't know how to kind of trace it back to root causes, but when you reduce the costs and you allow people to cycle faster and innovate faster, you get to build cooler yeah. things, Good and then you happens. start expecting it. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff happens. Exactly, yeah. well, talk, well, then, so let's go down to the uh, globalization, because it used to be, the uh -huh. old days, you launch in North America, you get it right there, and then you, you, know, you sequence out into the global marketplace. Now there's pressure to be global instantly, right? Yep. So that's a whole nother ball game. There's all kinds of regs, there's all kinds of localization issues. Um, if you remember the days, localization was huge. Now, so with cloud, there's now a pressure to launch globally. What are you guys doing? What's your vision there? And, and, and how do you talk to that issue? It's awesome. So uh, part of my job is I run the underlying e-commerce infrastructure for all of AWS. So when you buy EC2, I have to go bill you and, and pay you and collect it. So I will sit in rooms and I'll listen to a scenario that goes like this. What happens if a German national who works for a South Korean company is traveling to Japan and goes and spins up a EC2 instance in Brazil with a US uh, software company software on it. Tax, payments, regulatory, import, export, accounting, like how do you actually flow that back to your books? And half the room will be hammer and tongs with tax people and accountants and legal, like this is so hard. And half of me is like, yeah, this is hard, this is a hard day at the office. And the other half of me, is yeah. cackling with glee because yeah. we have 20 years at Amazon of solving these kind of global e-commerce problems. And so for me, one of the biggest pieces of value we provide in the marketplace is we've thought through this. So if you're a software company 10 years ago and you wanted to go sell in Germany, you had to go find a local provider who knew German regulations, who knew how to deal with local currency, and there's a lot of friction with your ability to sell. Years. Could take years. And now you can do it in the marketplace or in Amazon, like any customer in the world can use your software. So um, 
I like it a lot, this globalization. I actually think we're pretty good at it, and that's one of the things I'm the most proud of when I think of the value that we're giving from the marketplace. Okay, so let's, go, let's, get, let's geek out a little bit. Let's go under the hood, because obviously, um, one of the things I noticed about Amazon and our experience as a customer, a happy customer um, of Amazon with our CrowdChat application platform is there's a lot of stuff that's wired differently. Um, obviously, you talk about full stack, and you got managed services at the top of the stack, you got all kinds of goodness in the middle, EC2, queuing, et cetera, et cetera, and then you got all the, the, the iron underneath, all wired differently. So how is your web service marketplace wired? Talk about some of the, uh, if you can, how it's wired, how you're putting it together, and, and what that does for the, for the partners that are selling through the marketplace. All right, great. So we've got the front end services, which looks like a marketplace website. No surprise, Amazon has built a couple of these. And so technically, we are able to leverage a lot of the IP that Amazon.com, the retailer, has built over the last 10, 15 years. So recommendations and similarities and search and browse, all of that my teams get for, if not free, at a huge discount. And so building that part of the site is, in many ways, we're able to look at it and say, this is just another product, another set of marketplaces. But then underneath it, this is where we start to diverge from retail. Instead of a book or a blender, we're selling software. And the business models behind software, utility pricing, what does it mean when someone updates software, or there's a virus uh, patch that comes out, or you want to go from a single instance to a fleet of instances. All of that uh, fulfillment or deployment of software is where a lot of the guts and a lot of the IP from the marketplaces has come into. So the ability to take software and then quickly deploy it out, um, frankly, is, is where we spend a lot of time working on it. Uh, and the last piece is, it's the payments and the e-commerce part. Like, again, this is playing to our strengths. I love the fact that I can go and watch someone consuming software you know, every minute, build them and understand what's going on, and we can do it at a scale that is incredible. What's the coolest piece of tech in, in the stack for you guys with the web, with the marketplace that you, that you like? It's a more of a personal question. You don't have to you know, take sides with any one of the ch children within the uh, AWS community, but what piece did you like to say, this is, this is badass that drives a lot of the, uh, the value? <laughs> I think it is one click. I think it is the notion that I can find software, click a button, and have hardware deployed, software deployed, configured, running, and ready for use in a minute. It, the core yeah. notion of making consuming expensive, or sorry, not expensive, but complicated software infrastructure as easy as buying a Kindle book, that fundamentally is profoundly cool. That's a lot of friction you just took out of the process for both the buyers and for the companies who are selling the software. Terry, final question to end the segment. I'm getting a lot of pressure here from the folks to, to, uh, to move you along to your next meeting, but uh, <laughs> I got to ask you, you guys are, are driving down the road 100 miles an hour, great lead, doing great stuff, innovating. Um, what's the bumper sticker on the car as it leaves reInvent this year? What's the tagline? What's on the bumper sticker for this event? What would you What would you put on that bumper sticker this year? For AWS as a whole, or for the marketplace? Or the marketplace, the a whole vibe of this show coming out of Vegas. The car's driving away. What happened here? What is What's the What's that bumper sticker on the car from reInvent this year? Go faster, innovate faster. Let us help. Okay, we're here live at theCUBE, exclusive coverage of Amazon reInvent. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. Stay with us.